Hey, what's going on everybody? Today I'm going to be going over some uh, common comments that I have found um, across many of my videos and just kind of providing some extra clarification on maybe some mistakes that I have made or s things that just were not uh, completely clear in some of my videos. Um, these are comments that I have seen over and over um, as well as some mistakes that I've uh, noticed. Um, in some other videos. So before we begin, just thank you to everybody who has uh, subscribed to my videos. It really means a lot. It's it's uh, been a pretty good ride here. I was trying to hit a thousand subscribers and now we're over 5,000, which is unbelievable to me. So thank you to everybody who enjoys this content. But that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get into some of these questions here. So, so the first one is really not uh, so much a question, but clarification on my pie hole video. So the pie hole video for setting up a local DNS specifically is kind of null and void at this point. Um, I have seen a lot of comments saying that you can add local DNS records straight from the uh, GUI now, which is true. At the time I created that video, you could not do that. Um, they have since updated the software where you can actually do that configuration straight from the admin panel. And I'll just go ahead and show you right here on my own pie hole. Um, we do have a setting here on the left for local DNS records. And if you go to that you can add your dom domain your ip address and your local records without having to use the command line and create that uh, local dns list uh, file which was a little bit more complicated so that's just kind of make you aware that that video while it does still work and you can still do it that way there is an easier method um, just using the admin panel and i may or may not make a video in the future of uh, just using the admin panel for that and just kind of staying on the pie hole video, um, another question that I get asked a lot is, can you use port numbers um, with your pie hole local DNS records? And really what's being asked is if uh, you can redirect um, a URL to a specific uh, port number, like for example, Unify will use port 8443, and something like Plexby will use like 8181, or some non-default uh, port numbers for the applications being ran. Um, this is not something you can do with Pi-hole, and here is uh, just a little quick drawing as to why. So with DNS, all it does is it resolves a host name or URL to an IP address, but it will not tack on anything additional to that IP address. Um, really what you're typing into your browser is what determines what port number it's gonna use. So I've, I'm sure you've seen before when you type into a web browser like HTTP, uh, and HTTPS. And when you type these into your web browser, automatically HTTP is gonna be looking for port 80 at the destination and HTTPS is gonna be looking for port 443. So these are kind of your two standard port numbers. You cannot change this in DNS. Now there are other ways around it. Um, the application server itself could have a redirect set up for port 80 or port 443, but if it does not, um, in the case of Unify, I know is one that doesn't uh, have that, you will need some other mechanism to do it. And I actually did a video on what's called a reverse proxy, and that is how you will get around this. And if you haven't checked out that video, go check it out. But basically, just a quick rundown, uh, you've got you, your pie hole, and your Unify controller. So typically what you would do is you would type in your uh, URL that you set in pie hole already for like Unify dot LAN, it would go to your pie hole and it would kick back the IP address for your Unify controller. And then your PC would go to the Unify controller and basically try to access it on port 80 or 443, which will kick back an error because the service is actually running on port 8443. So what you do here is you create kind of a middleman, which is a reverse proxy. And instead of pointing uh, your Pi-hole DNS record straight to the Unify application server, you would point that record to the reverse proxy's IP instead. And then you would set up uh, the configuration on that to point to the Unify server on the back end. So what would happen instead is you would uh, try to access that URL. Your Pi-hole would kick back the new record which is the IP address for the reverse proxy and not Unify. And then you would access your reverse proxy on port 80 or 443, whichever uh, you're configured for. And then your reverse proxy would take care of the communication between uh, you and the Unify controller. It's kind of a middleman and the configuration for using port 8443 would be housed on the reverse proxy. So that's just kind of a quick overview. If you haven't checked it out, go uh, look at that video. But the main point is that you cannot attach 
port numbers to DNS records um, in a standard DNS server. You have to use something like a reverse proxy uh, for that or redirection on the application itself. Okay, moving on to uh, my edge router videos. Um, I think the main comment I get on those is from something that I said a little bit incorrectly near the end. Um, I believe I said that if you hold the reset button down, it will wipe the device's ability to work. And looking back, it, that sentence kind of sounds like um, you're gonna brick the device if you hold the reset button. Like don't use the reset button because it's just gonna break your router and you're never going to be able to use it again. That is not what I meant by that. Um, I was just comparing and contrasting to a regular router that you might find at uh, your local superstore because typically routers, um, regular home routers, when you buy them, you just hook them up. They automatically have DHCP enabled. They automatically have the WAN interface set for DHCP and they automatically have uh, like a 192.168.1. whatever network configured. So when you hold the reset button down on a regular router, it just reverts everything to this configuration, which is basically plug and play. And what I meant on the edge router video is that if you go through the initial configuration and you configure it uh, for use in your home network, and then you hold down the reset button, you have to go back through the initial setup process because by default, out of the box, um, ethernet zero is set with its own IP address of 192.168.1.1 but you have no DHCP, you have no LAN, and you can't connect, connect it to a modem and have it work. You have to connect to Ethernet Zero, go to that IP address, and go through the basic configuration wizard, which is what I go through in my video. And just what I meant by holding the reset button was that it will revert you to this factory configuration where you won't be passing traffic on your network anymore until you go through that setup wizard again. That was all I meant by that. And I could have worded it better. Now another question that uh, I get asked a lot on the edge router videos is for the offloading commands. At the end of that video I showed you how to enable hardware offloading which increases the performance of the device. However, I did not uh, mention that there's actually two different sets of offloading commands depending on which device you have. And I'm going to take you to Unify's uh, website for this real quick. Now the easiest way really to get here is just to Google um, edge router hardware offload and it should be the first um, link here or one of the first ones. Um, we're just going to click on this hardware offloading. This is what we're looking for. It's the official Unify document on hardware offloading and it's going to tell you that there are two different um, types here. So you've got MediaTek and Cavium. And these are the two hardware platforms that all edge routers run on. And you can see the specific models for it. The ERX, ER10X, ERXSFP, and the EPR6 are all MediaTek based, while the rest of them are Cavium based. Now, the difference in those is really the hardware that it's running on. Um, the MediaTek ones have hardware bridging where the Cavium ones do not. That's the main difference between the two, but we won't really get into that. For hardware offloading, we can see the commands here. So in my video, I was using an Edge Router X, which is MediaTek based. So these were the commands that we put in and it was um, set system, let's see, see if they have the real one. Yeah, right here, set system offload HWNAT enable and set system offload IPsec enable. These are the two commands that I use in the video and those are the only two you need to use because HWNAT enables hardware offloading for bridging DPI NAT VLANs, GRI, PPPoE, and that is it. And then your IPsec command enables offloading for IPsec. But we can see over here on the right for Cavium based devices, they're a little bit different. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see the commands for that. So to enable offloading on a Cavium based device, you would need set system offload IP4, forwarding, GRI, PPPoE, VLAN, and bonding. And you can also do the same thing for IPv6, forwarding PPPoE and VLAN. And IPsec is its own thing again. And if we scroll back up here, we can see what those different commands do. IPv4 forwarding enables offload for DPI and NAT. IPv4 or IPv6 VLAN enables it for VLANs. IPv4 GRI, GRI, IPv4 or IPv6 PPPoE, PPPoE, and IPsec once again, just for IPsec. Now you do have this additional one on a Cavium based device, which is for bonding, um, that is not available on the 
MediaTek based ones. And you can also see that there is no command to enable hardware offloading for bridging, which is because the Cavium based devices do not have um, a hardware switch in them. So you can't enable that feature. So that's the differences in the offloading commands. If you do watch the video and you're using say an Edge Router 4 for example, and you're going to enable offloading and you use the HWNAT and IPSec commands, the only one that's going to take is IPSec because the commands for that specific device are different. And there are only two sets. It's either MediaTek or Cavium. So you're either going to be using those two commands or that list uh, that I showed you at the bottom there for the Cavium based devices. Now, another question that I get asked a lot on my Edge Router uh, VLAN video is why I created an additional VLAN interface. So if you watch that video, you'll see that I'm configuring all the ports for different VLANs and I created, I think I created two or three different uh, VLAN interfaces there. But I said that I made um, another one for VLAN 1 to keep myself from being locked out. This is not necessary at all, really. Um, I was just a little bit wary of configuring them because I had been locked out of my router before. And because I use a Cisco switch with my edge router, um, the default VLAN is VLAN 1. So I decided to create a VLAN interface for VLAN 1 just to kind of be safe. But in all honesty, if the configuration was screwed up, I was going to be locked out regardless. That really didn't provide me any safety net. It was just kind of my own peace of mind and not really completely understanding it um, so much. So really, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to make a VLAN interface for safety purposes, just as long as your switch and your router's uh, VLANs match, you should be good to go. All right, moving on to my Unify AP videos. Uh, first, I'm going to correct a mistake that I said in one of them, and that was where you have your Unify AP connected to PoE on the primary interface and that some Unify APs have a secondary interface which will pass through the PoE to say another access point. This is not actually true. Um, I messed up on that. The secondary interface on a Unify AP will not pass through PoE, it will only pass through data. So if you are piggybacking a uh, another access point, you will need to put in an injector in the middle. So that was just a mistake that I made. I don't think I actually looked it up. I think I just said it assuming that they could do that and uh, they cannot. So uh, if you try it, that's why it doesn't work. And sorry about that. The next question on the Unify um, APs is, it has to do with the injector I used in the first time setup video. Um, I was using an older uh, AP Pro, which either supports um, some standard PoE protocols or 48 volt passive. Now, typically your APs are only gonna support either 24 volt passive or a regular standard like AT, uh, off the top of my head, I forget, but the regular ones that you can get with almost any switch that has PoE um, and not 48 volt. The injector I had is a 48 volt and those are really only for the older access points. So really what you wanna do is go to Unify and look at the specific um, PoE types that your access point you bought takes. And this is how you get to that. So once again at Google, just type in Unify AP PoE, and that should bring you to the article. Uh, let's see, down here, help at UI, supported PoE output and input modes. And this will give you a list somewhere down the page of the types of PoE. So you've got passive 24 volt, and then these are your standard protocols that uh, some switches support or injectors if you are using that. So you've got AF, AT, and BT. And then you've got all of your access point models. Now, the one that I was using is actually not on this because it's technically a legacy device now. Um, actually, down here, UAP Pro, this is the one I was using. It says that 802.3 AF is the only one it supports. However, it does support 48 volt passive, and that was the PoE injector that I was using. And going back to that last question, you can see here the UAP in wall only supports PoE pass through when powered by 802.3 AT. There are access points that do have PoE pass through, they're just not the regular Unify ones, they're the in wall um versions not the ap ac ap lr uh, your typical circle shaped ones it's the special in wall ones that have poe pass through but getting back to the main point this is just the table that you would use if you let's say you have the uh ac light which is a good cost effective one to buy you can see you can use passive 24 volt poe or 802.3 af with it and if you have the lr same thing but if you move up to the bigger ones like the AC, well, where is it? 
ECEM Pro. They do not support 24 volt passive, only sports AF. And the HDs don't even support 3.AF, they support 3.AT. So if you do get a new access point or switch, switches are in here as well. Um, that f I actually just bought a new flex switch and you can see it supports 802.3AF. So if you are dealing with PoE, just consult this table for what kind of injector you would need. Oh, and one more thing on the Unify controller while we're talking about it. Um, another common question I get asked is regarding the controller. So we all know that Unify devices use what's called the Unify controller in order to configure and maintain them. So if you have something like the security gateway, Unify access point, or Unify switch, you have to set them up using controller software, and that could be running on anything like the cloud key that you can get from Unify, a Raspberry Pi, your Windows or Mac computer, or whatever else you can get it to run on because they have a uh, Linux version of it, so you can really put it on anything that's compatible. Now the main question I get asked is if this has to be running 24-7. And the answer is no. The only time you have to have the controller on is when you are setting up the device for the first time, adopting a new device, or if you're coming back to make changes for any reason. Once you've configured a device, like your access point, if you configure the SSIDs, or you configure the port VLANs, or the networks on the security gateway, you don't have to keep the controller running. Once those settings are set, they are there, they are on the devices, and the only time the devices will need to contact the controller is if there is a configuration change. Now there are a few features that do require a 24-7 controller, but those are the guest captive portal or statistics. So when you set up a guest network, if you want it to take um, your users to a web page where they have to sign in to the guest network, then that requires the controller be on. And also, this is kind of self-explanatory, but the statistics that, con that the controller gathers, like client uh, connection histories, uh, failed connections, bandwidth throughput, all of the cool stats and graphs that the controller can show you, it won't do that if it doesn't have any data and it can't collect that data if it is not running. So if you do power up the controller and then turn it off as soon as you're done configuring it, just remember that you can't use the guest portal option and when you boot the controller up to make a change in the future, you won't have any statistics from the last time you turned it off. But the main point is that the controller does not need to be running in order for the devices themselves to work. They are independent of each other and the only reason you need the controller is to configure the devices. And that's really all of the main questions uh, that I had to answer. Um, if there are any additional ones, just let me know. Hopefully I'll make another video like this, eh, probably in another year or so, um, once I make a few more mistakes and put out new videos. But hopefully it cleared some of it up for you. So thank you to everybody who has subscribed, and happy networking.